Welcome everybody. Let me start by acknowledging that we are here meeting on the land of the Wadjuk Noongar people. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Lee Kinsella and I am the curator of the Crothers Collection of Women's Art and it is my great pleasure to see you here um, to enjoy the exhibitions that are on display. All of the exhibitions are currently from the Crothers Collection and of course we're featuring the work of Jodie Quackenbush. The university is incredibly fortunate to hold um, work by Jodie, both fabric and photography works. Um, and they are recent additions to the Crothers collection. So very important that we have representation of Jodie's work in the collection, but also that we have the means by which we get to show them off as well. So um, I know Jodie will be covering all sorts of interesting territory in this talk. And um, I thank her for her generosity in touching on some potentially quite difficult subject matter. So um, without further ado, I think the artist is well able to talk to her work. <laughs> Please welcome Jodie Quackenbush. Okay, so um, starting with this slide, it is an array of masks that, and it's kind of the earlier masks that I um, have been making since 2012. And I've kind of given up making masks now with the invent of COVID. It has become such a popular um, medium for um, making artwork. So yeah, this is a very small array. I also make headpieces, hats, um, but I've more so gone into making costumes, which you'll see later. But I guess I should just talk about the way that I make um, the masks and it's a very organic kind of process. So uh, I don't do a, like a, a, a drawing or anything in the beginning. I just kind of let the materials kind of, uh, you know, uh, inspire me. And it's a lot about the collection of interesting um, materials. So this is um, obviously the piece that's been um, acquired by the Crothers, which is in this exhibition. And it is a deep sea fish one way and an octopus the other. And this was the very first mask that I ever made. So the way that I made this mask was kind of interesting or how it came to be about in the sense that um, my brother had been dating um, uh, he lives in Japan and he came over on a flight um, from Japan and his girlfriend at the time was wearing like a beauty mask that covered her whole face and this is back in 2012 and he was telling me about it because he said it was very strange sitting next to her um, yeah it looked very odd and um, I saw this mask and I was like oh this this is an artwork I can see this developing into something so I asked her if I could have it and then I went about collecting materials that um, related, uh, that were kind of the same kind of colour scheme. And I found this little girl's dress, which was um, like she, uh, maybe for a five-year-old or a four-year-old. And um, I really liked the idea of kind of um, using it and kind of um, making it a kind of subversive work. But, um, at the same time as making this work, previous to this, I'd been very interested in deep sea creatures and I'd made a lot of light sculptures out of found plastics and so this was really um, on got, like a, inspired from all that work I'd done about um, deep sea creatures and um, things like that. So, so this is the other picture that has been acquired by the Crothers and it might have been some time later that I, with a friend, decided to go and um, just see if we could take a picture in the local butcher shop. So it was a very um, quick photo shoot because they were not extremely happy. And it kind of is interesting because my I graduated in 1999 from um, the West Australian School of Art and Design and my work was extremely abject. I guess it was quite popular to make abject work back in those days. And I kind of had all these years later come back to making this very abject work. So 
abject for anyone that's not familiar with that term. It basically is uh, attraction and repulsion, that kind of idea of um, simultaneously um, you know, experiencing both. So, but, and my work back in 1999 was I made um, dresses out of sweaty pillowcases. So it was really quite disgusting. And um, the, the, it, they were so yellow from the sweat, but people had thought I dyed them with tea bags or something, but I hadn't, it was just sweat. But anyway, um, and it also relates to my work from my other, when I also graduated from ECU, I was very interested in spacemen and um, I made a space suit and things like that, and deep sea creature sculptures. So that's that. So this is also a photograph um, by me that is, I'm, I have to say that I work with photographers more now. I don't really take my own photography for a couple of reasons. Um, I kind of don't have the equipment um, and I am a very quick photographer. I don't really um, take that long to take a shoot. I like to be quite um, quick about it, which, um, and I don't like to edit loads of images. But this is taken in a rural setting about 45 minutes out of Perth. And again, I've used my friends as models. And um, yeah. And the interesting thing about the way that these masks are made is they're very much made from um, memento mori from my great grandmother and my grandmother. Um, and um, this is a picture of my great grandmother and my grandmother, and they on my maternal side, and they were both um, very good seamstresses. And my great grandmother was a tailor. So basically, I have like this collect. Well, I did have a collection of lace and um, buttons and beads and haberdashery um, from from that from them. And uh, also there's a tutu on this particular mask, which has gone into the brothers. And that was my mother's um, tutu. So yeah, I probably shouldn't have cut it up, but I did. And this mask is interesting because I have used chairs a lot in my work as well. Like even when I was making light sculptures, I would make them out of chairs a lot of the time, or I'd make bustle out of a chair, more of a costume. But in this particular work, this is from a chair. So, and the chair, notably, is, was my grandmother's. So when she died, I asked for the chair because um, I knew I wanted to make an artwork about it. I probably could have um, done it in more of a holistic way, but um, yeah, I just took a bit of fabric from the chair and made this mask, and again, did the photo shoot um, 45 minutes out of Perth, but this time I worked and collaborated with a photographer. Her name was Michelle Lucking, and she's now a wedding photographer, but at the time she was just a student, um, but very talented, and I worked with her. So this is just like a snapshot of some of the shoots that I've done. And I guess it's interesting to kind of talk about whether some of them are verging on fashion photography, or fine art, um, but I, I always try, I guess, to assert that there's some kind of um, deeper meaning behind um, the photographs. But the only photograph taken by me is the second one along there. Um, the others, um, the one, the fourth one along is taken by uh, Von Doherty and uh, Michelle Lucking again, I think. Um, but um, I've also worked with Miles Knoll, who's a friend of mine, who's a graphic designer, and Juliet Duval, who used to take a lot of pictures of rock bands and things, but um, she's also a friend of mine. Um, yeah, so. So this kind of is leading more to like making more of a holistic costume. And in 2017, I decided to have what I would call a happening, I suppose because it wasn't like um, a planned performance or anything, but it was a happening, it was a dinner party. And it was called the Dead Artist Dinner. And basically I made costumes that were inspired by these eight, eight artists um, from history who uh, are deceased. And I made a costume 
that was inspired by either a work of theirs or the the time that they lived and the work of theirs or something to do with um, the way that they dressed. So the example I have here is of Simone Johnson, who's a, um, a curator or works in the arts and an artist, and she is Louise Nevelson. So Louise Nevelson, for anyone that doesn't know her work, I based this on a piece of hers called Royal One, which is a very large assemblage that is all painted gold. Um, and yeah, it's an example of um, how I've used the artwork to inspire the costume. And we tried to do a, way too many things at this dinner party. Um, I had quizzes, obviously we ate food, we had pictures on black backgrounds, we also had in, like just the, the impromptu shots. Um, and it was very successful. Um, many people want me to do it again, probably so they can come. And um, but yeah, I'm yeah, I kind of would like a grant to do it again, but we'll see. So this is the piece that I redid. I I did it originally for the Botanic Art Prize. Um, pretty sure it was 2020, and I cut. For that prize, I coloured in both this image and another image of a large assemblage, which you can't quite see here, but I put all um, botanical instruments and things that related to the subject, which is Georgiana Malloy. So Georgiana Malloy was an early settler botanist, and she um, was my inspiration because there is a flower named after her called the Georgiana Malloy, or um, say a bit differently, I think. but. Yeah, there's a flower named after her, which is this very small baronia. And that was my inspiration for the costume. But as well as that, it was also related to her early life um, and or her life and the way that she, um, or what she brought with her to Australia, which, which apparently she brought a very impractical pink dress um, and a dunstable bonnet. And um, yeah, the picture, I liked that I coloured it in because a lot of, uh, you saw the pictures earlier, looked kind of fashion photography, like they could be in a magazine or something. But this, I was kind of trying to make it look quite gothic and I wanted to firmly ground it in, a, you know, in my fine art practice. And I think there's something about it looking uncanny. There's something about it um, uh, mimicking what were the early, coloured images, obviously, before the invent of colour photography. So this was actually done a little bit earlier than that work. And this is um, related to the work that is in this exhibition, but it's some of the outtakes from that photo shoot. There was something performative about the photo shoot. And um, it is a, basically, I'm dressed as Camille Claudel. So Camille Claudel was, um, it's much talked about that she was involved with Rodin. Of course, it's, you know, we don't like to necessarily define her because of that. She was extremely talented in her own right um, and she was a sculptor. So she had, um, basically it's debatable like what her mental health was like, but um, she basically was incarcerated for 30 years um, I think she went into a mental asylum in France in, um, in her early 40s. And I've also taken this picture of myself in my early 40s. And the reason that I'm smashing the mask in the picture is because she actually did get quite a rate and smash a lot of her, um, uh, her, her casts. And the other picture is another kind of version of me thinking about the myth of the Perseus and the Gorgon. And the reason that I'm thinking about that myth is because that was her last commission. And it was her last commission, and the very interesting thing about it is that she's fashioned the face of the Medusa on her own face. And I found that incredibly interesting. But I think, first of all, I should probably explain why I wanted to be Camille Claudel. And the reason that I wanted to be Camille Collardell was because I have been to one Eastern um, mental institution and probably four, uh, one Eastern, four Western mental institutions. 
And so I relate to her obviously because of a shared um, uh, mental health diagnosis or incarceration in those kind of institutions. And the way that I made the jacket is also interesting, I should probably note, is that it's made from several different garments, collected garments again from um, op shops and the like. And I've written Camille Cordell in um, sequins on the arms and it's a restraint jacket. So um, yeah, and also the back is quite interesting because it's got a clip um, which is from a suitcase. So again, again, using um, uh, different objects to make the jacket. And it's got, a, I think it's got 30 crosses that I've, you can't see it in this picture, but if you look at the jacket, there's got 30 crosses on it that represent all the years that she was in that institution, as well as quotes um, that she had said while she was in um, an institution. But going back to Perseus and the Gorgon, so for those of you that don't know about the, the myth, it is a so-called heroic tale. I don't know how heroic I find it, but um, Perseus is the protagonist and he was sent on this quest by uh, his great-grandfather, who was obviously a god, I think it was Apollo, and he had sent him on this quest because he thought that there was some like prophecy that he would eventually be killed by Perseus. So he sent him on this quest to kill the Medusa. So the Medusa was originally a maiden and she um, had been turned into a Medusa because she had so been raped by Poseidon and then she had been punished by Athena. So um, yeah, not very feminist in that sense and she um, he had been sent and he had been sent with several things and one of them was a shield you can't see a shield in her depiction in the sculpture but she had been sent he'd been sent with a shield because if you look into her eyes you'll be turned to stone so mine is kind of a play on that and the fact that I'm looking at the the, the viewer and the mirror is looking back at me but it's also related to a quote that I like, which is a Nietzsche quote. And it's, if you be careful if you fight with monsters, lest you become one, and if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gaze back into you. And I find this quite um, a pertinent quote. I think it's probably his most popular quote. And the ideas that I'm about to say have not, like, I don't think, um, you know, anyone really has framed it in this way, but this is what it means to me anyway in the sense of um, be careful if you fight monsters means to me lest you become one is like try not to be a victim of your um, experiences and I'm directly relating it to psychotic experience so because um, that's very much my philosophy as well as um, if you gaze into the abyss the abyss gazes back into you I think about this in respects to um, auditory hallucination and I think about it in respect of uh, people that experience auditory hallucination often think that it's something outside of themselves, but is it maybe just a reflection of the internal and the, um, yeah, of the self. So this leads me to my, like, things that I'm currently inspired by. And this is a jacket by Agnes Richter. Now, Agnes Richter wasn't a famous artist. She was just a woman that was incarcerated in an um, institution in um, the Victorian era. So she, I mean, the institutions were probably like workhouses back in um, those times, and she was probably there in a seamstress capacity because she had worked as a seamstress before her incarceration. So this is her amazing jacket, which I'd love to see one day. It's in a, it's in a psychiatric collection in Germany. And it has all this language on it, which is kind of indecipherable because it's uh, an obscure dialect. Um, and, but there is one sentence written on it, which is, um, I plunge headlong into disaster, which can be made out. And I have done my own version of this jacket. And it relates nothing to it aesthetically, um, but I have redone that sentence 
I plunge headlong into disaster several times and you can't quite see it in this picture, but there's a skull there. And um, it's just, it's quite, it's, I think of it as more of an art therapy piece than a kind of like a, you know, a, a real fine art object. But, um, and I'm inspired from outside art in general, however. And I plunge headlong into disaster is, um, the reason it looks like graffiti and it's so messy I mean, um, it's not just because I'm not that good at embroidery. It's because when I was in Thailand, I originally got sick in Thailand. And I, um, I remember being taken to this back section and there was all this graffiti um, on this wall because um, I ended up in it. I was meditating in Thailand to explain. And I ended up in a Thai mental institution, and, which relates to the next piece that I'll show you, which is what I'm doing now. But I also think I should probably touch more on, and I, sh um, I don't have more slides to show you the pictures, but um, there are some very interesting outside artists and or um, works that um, have been made by people who have been institutionalized. So one work, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but there's uh, Richard Dad, and he, was uh, he has a piece in the Tate, and it's called um, the, the the Fairy Master's Masterstroke, and it's also on a famous album, I think. But um, it's this very intricate, obsessive picture, and it's of fairies, um, and he had painted it over nine years when he was in an institution. I like the idea of people doing things under such duress because it's like, would I make art if I didn't have this quite comfortable, um, you know, life? Like, would I make it if, if, if I, you know, was living out of my car or something? And I once met a woman actually who was living out of her car, but she still was putting on exhibitions and things. And I thought how amazing that was. But this is the last slide that I have. And this is kind of talking about the way that I use objects or I make objects, make textile objects, and then now I'm turning them into paintings, which relate to my experiences, particularly of um, my experiences in Thailand. So this, I, when I was put in the institution in Thailand, which was called Suan Prong, and it was in Chiang Mai, I was um, put in this outfit, which looked like a, pre, you know, looked like I was in Orange is the New Black or something. I was in this prison outfit and I tried to find something that looked a bit similar and I dyed it. And I, I was kind of, it was a bit of a joke writing Suan Prong on the back in the sense like, like a band shirt might look like have the year or the, the band name on the back of the shirt or something. But also the, the devil mask, which is in the painting is an actual object as well. So I'm always probably, I, I love to paint, but I'm always inspired from textiles as well and textiles that I've created. And I'm halfway through this body of work, which, um, yeah, is about my experiences in Thailand. But um, I probably, I think I talked really, really fast. So I, I don't know how we're going for time. I think I've probably ended it too soon. But um, yeah, if we could open it, if anyone has questions for me on any of the slides. Um, yes? Well, that's interesting, actually, because um, when I was in the meditation place, they said to me, you can't um, do anything. So I wasn't allowed to look at people in the eye. I wasn't allowed to listen to music, read books, draw, paint, anything. But I did do a picture of a moth, <laughs> which is why I put the moth there. And I, I, I um, spent a lot of time observing ants and um, I draw a few ants. And this, this, you can't see it on this picture, but there is actually an ant that I've done on the leg of this garment. And I was wanting to do ants going up all the leg of the garment because I actually became so um, desensitized from my body, at, which is why I ended up in hospital. And I had ants growing up, crawling up my legs and I was totally oblivious, like I didn't care. So, um, but the answer to other mental institutions is interesting because I've actually got some 
um, big um, drawings that I've done of um, colouring in because it's a really naff thing that they always give you in Western mental institutions, which is like those, those black and white printouts. And you're like, yeah, uh, uh, they're meant for small children. I know that they're popular with mindfulness or whatever, but I just find it ridiculous. And especially probably because I'm a trained artist, I'm like, I'm not doing that. So um, yeah, um, I actually did make a piece that comments on the kind of, um, I, was, I was basically making my own color, uh, like printouts, but I'd done them in color first. And then I was gonna take out the color and make a, um, a book which was a colouring in book, which was based on um, the experiences of Thailand. Because yeah, I, I, and also the materials they give you if you go to a Western, there's always a little like awful art corner and all the pencils are blunt and there's not, you know, if, if there's anything, yeah, good luck making anything there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you talked about the artist dinner that you did and you thought about you know, if you had a grant to do another one. Yeah. What artist did you have at that dinner? Oh, like what, what dead artists yeah, would I be inspired by? Oh, I'd have to really think about it. Um, oh. I can't off the top of my head. I, I, <laughs> you've asked me a hard question. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd really have to do a lot of research and, and also I guess what I should know is that sometimes who the artist came as or the curator was someone that inspired them or their work as well. So I was kind of working with both um, um, what inspired me and what inspired them. So yeah, I'd probably ask the artists who they wanted to come as, yeah. Oh no, hand stitch, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do a bit of both, I guess, hand stitching and, um, yeah. Um, well, I guess the piece before, the, um, as I said, the, I think about this as a bit of art therapy because I'm, I'm almost, yeah, it's just meditative and I'm just like picking up the next colour or, yeah, I mean, this is very unplanned, as you can see. It's not really a home, like, design thing, but it's, it's kind of organic and it kind of just evolves, you know, you know, whatever direction it wants to go in. Yeah. In true style, I have multiple pictures. I can't contain myself, but my comment on these is it, it appears like they're almost protective guns, that there's almost like chain mail, like the intensity with which you... Mm. buttons and things on it. So rather than a garment of constraint, it feels like that you're enhancing yourself a bit as well. Uh, yes. So I guess I should talk about the weight of the garments as well because in um, I, I went particularly to Bedlam in London and I looked at their psychiatric collection and I was really interested in the fact that they talked about the way the garments were weighted and um, because there is a, um, a history of weighted garments um, in psychiatry. Like we, we kind of only really think about the restraint garments and the terrible, horrific kind of, you know, um, armatures or whatever that, that were used on people. But there is actually this idea of, of weighting garments in order for it to be of comfort. And of course, there are um, like autistic um, people, I think, can find some comfort in um, having a weighted blanket now, maybe for children and, and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I guess I should also say that I, um, yeah, I'm kind of trying to not necessarily focus on the horror of it, but um, make kind of something that's quite joyful and um, celebratory. Um, yeah.
bounced off 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 one to the next yeah I mean I've often thought that I'd be a lot more successful in the art scene if I just stuck to one thing if I just promoted it in a big way like some people seem to it's like I'm a painter boom that's what I do but I don't I don't feel inspired by working like that yeah I just I don't and you're right they they all kind of come in and relate to each other and bounce off each other and I often will take apart a costume and then use it in something else later. So it's interesting also that a lot of the costumes don't exist anymore because I take them apart and I re refashion them as well. Yeah. Well, I've actually got, I, I've got a painting, I've actually got this other jacket, which is probably more interesting than, than this one, but it's, it's, because it is actually a restraint jacket, but it, it also has um, antipsychotic, old antipsychotic um, medication sewn into it and all sorts of things like that. And the other jacket, I really should have included it, but it has um, a poem written on it, which is relates to Thailand or, you know, it relates to a different, um, time but um, yeah it relates to a narrative and a story um, yeah sorry what was your question again <laughs> would you do a painting? oh painting and I have done paintings of that jacket which I was just describing but yeah for sure I mean yeah it, it's got such textural elements that it would be quite enjoyable to paint yeah Sometimes it makes it very hard to actually paint something that's such an unusual yeah. object as well. And you can't see the back here, but the back has like dragons on it, so yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, so I'm very against displaying things on mannequins, basically. Um, so, because I'm, I'm really always trying to frame it in a non, um, you know, non-fashion kind of shop kind of way. So, um, I often, so this, yeah, this structure is like a valet stand. And I like the idea that you can look into the object and see the internal, um, because the inside is as important as the outside and if you put it on a mannequin then you're just not going to see anything but the outside. Um, yeah. And I made what is, um, I made the one that's displaying over there as well, especially for that reason of, um, yeah, being able to kind of look in a little bit into the object. Look, I'm in awe of what Jodie's just been able to deliver. I think it's a remarkable thing. So thank you so much, Jodie. Um, I think this is a remarkable um, addition to have this material in the exhibition. And um, obviously there's a lot literally built into these objects, but there's a lot that extends out from them. So um, can you please join with me and thank Jodie for that remarkable talk.